Okay, great. Well, thank you everybody again for joining us for the International COVID-19 HPC Knowledge Exchange webinar. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I have some really great updates for you guys today. Uh, I think it's going to be a wonderful presentation. My name is Sean Brown. I'm the director of the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center, and I represent the Exceed Project uh, and in the United States, the NSF Cyber Infrastructure and the HPC COVID-19 uh, uh, Consortium. And I'll give it a chance for my colleague in uh, Europe, uh, Matej, to introduce himself as well. And my name is Matej Prapnik. Hello, everybody. So I'm a uh, Head of, of Theory Department at the National Institute of Chemistry and Professor of Physics at the University of Ljubljana in Slovenia. And I am a Chair of PRACE Scientific Steering Committee. PRACE is a similar organization to EXCEED, but it's in Europe. So here we are just um, presenting all the PIs from our projects from both sides of the pond and hopefully get some results soon. And collaborations and exchange of information and data and so sharing of data. And I'm uh, excited for today's talk. So I think that the first speaker, so should we, would you introduce him or? Uh, well, I just I? want to make a couple, I just want to make a couple of announcements. Um, uh, uh, first off, I just wanted to point everybody to the chat window and thank you Ahmed for uh, sharing your, uh, your work with us. Uh, Ahmed just shared a GitHub repository. Do you want to say a few words about that, Ahmed, before before we move on? Are you still on? Oh, I saw him on. Okay. Yeah, I said he, sorry, I was just unmuting. There you go. Okay, good, great, thanks. Sorry, uh, so I can quickly tell you our work. So our work is based on generating uh, or extracting features for uh, protein sequences. We already trained uh, big language models using uh, natural language processing models like PERT and PERT XLNet on uh, huge data sets of um, protein sequences. Unsupervised, there's no single label, including UNF100 and BFD100. It's uh, more than two billion um, uh, protein sequences in this case. Uh, we already released our work uh, in a paper. I'm going to send it also here in case you are interested in reading it. And uh, also we have our GitHub repo, which you can find uh, all the pre models. You can just download it and you can use it for COVID-19 feature extraction. Uh, this, uh, this actually is pretty good for sequences where no evaluation information exists at all. So you can try it and people who are working in, for example, structure prediction can uh, give it a try. And uh, it was also uh, features in uh, NVIDIA blog, main website. You can also check it there. And yeah, please try it and give us your feedback. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you very much for sharing. That's awesome. Uh, and as he said, the links are in the chat window, and I, I can post them off to the the um, Slack channel uh, after after the meeting. So, th yeah, thank you for sharing. Um, and then uh, the other thing we were we were discussing uh, in our uh, meeting the, earlier this week to maybe reduce the frequencies of these so that we uh, make so that we're not exhausting the community by having these every two weeks. So we're toying with the idea of having them once a month uh, uh, and. Uh, just slowing it down a little bit um, and, and maybe making it a little longer and having more updates each month. So we'll keep you posted on the email list and in the Slack channel um, when the next meeting will be just uh, because we want to make sure we want to be cognizant of the fact that this is a, uh, we're asking people to join us and we want to give a good forum for people to update and create collaborations, but we also want to give people time to actually do their, do the work that they're, they're doing. I know a lot of people are busy. So we really appreciate you all joining us. Uh, thank you very much for uh, going, uh, attending. We'll go ahead and uh, start with our first update, which is uh, Florence Hudson, uh, the Executive Director of the Northeast Big Data Innovation Hub and Columbia University in the United States. And she's gonna be telling us about the, uh, the COVID uh, Knowledge Commons. Excellent. Thank you very much for having me. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Excellent. Well, it's great to meet you all. And um, yep, I have the right one up. This is my third time presenting this in two days. <laughs> so, like, is it very the right seasoned? One? Very seasoned. <laughs> is it the, yeah, the very, is it the cover page? So, um, the COVID Information Commons um, is an NSF funded website and program. And the purpose of it is to serve as an open resource to explore US NSF funded research addressing the COVID 19 pandemic. That's how it was created. Since this is an international group, I'm very interested in uh, maybe you trying it out and seeing if you want us to collaborate more because we're looking at what our next proposal would be if we want to expand this. 
and it was um, it's funded by the NSF Convergence Accelerator, which is a new a newer NSF program where they're trying to bring together multidisciplinary research, and that's really what we're doing. Um, can you see the right side? Because I have like my pictures there. It doesn't stop. It, you can't see that, right? So I can see your faces. Okay, so I can see if like you're going, what is she talking about? So let me give you a quick overview. So um, it's an open website. Anyone can use it around the planet. You can use it. Your mother can use it. Your kids can use it. Your students can use it. Anybody can use it. Um, and it enables exploration of these NSF-funded research uh, grants addressing COVID-19. It increases accessibility of this information. So part of the FAIR principles, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, findable, you know, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, and it's a it's a resource for researchers, students. I think it's a really good opportunity. We're thinking of creating like a student paper competition where they can go in and you know, leverage this data, which would be fun. It could be for like governors if they wanna see how many awards they got versus another state. A lot of you can use this in many different ways, but we really wanna use it for helping researchers find each other and collaborate regarding COVID-19. So um, it organizes relevant information by research topic, by institution, geography. I'll show you some examples. And in the future, our plan is to, um, we've been gathering data from the PIs, the COVID PIs from NSF. We have 167 <laughs> survey responses already, and we ask them for links to their data, their GitHub, like you just did, um, you know, another website, whatever it is. And we're trying to figure out in the next day, the next phase, how we put that in here so you have even more data. And then um, we're also enabling collaboration. We just announced a Slack channel yesterday, and I'll show you it's on our website. And then, um, and then we're also planning to work with some of the NSF Open Knowledge Network projects, which are a lot of projects around pulling data sources together from multiple areas to enable better data science. So our MVP launch was July 7th. We got the award May 15th. So we've been like running like this. And um, one of the tools actually came from inside of NSF and they exposed it for us so we could leverage it. There are two uh, search mechanisms. One is a customized NSF simple search for COVID rapid wards by directorate, which I'll show you. And then it's COVID Research Explorer, which is a fancy machine learning generated map tool. And in both of them, you know, there's powerful query and visualization. You can drill down by award. And I told you what we're gonna be doing in the future. So this is what would happen if you go to the home page. This is what it would look like. Um, and you can see here, it's covidinfocommons.net is um, the URL you can use. You can go there now if you want to, if I'm boring you. And then you would click on this for the Research Explorer and Machine Learning Maps. It's a little further down on the home page, just below the blue button, it says click these icons to find NSF Rapid Grants <laughs> by NSF Directorate. And we have all eight directorates here. And it's brought to you by the, we have four big data innovation hubs. Have any of you worked with the big data hubs before? A little bit, okay. So uh, in the US, we have four big data hubs, Northeast, South, Midwest, and West. And we're all working together on this. We're the lead institution. The, the grant was given to Columbia University where I am. Um, and But we all, we've all been working on this together. Here's the project team. Here's our PI, Jeanette Wing. Oh, sorry, um, another spam call. And then these are the four executive directors across the hubs. And then here's the operations team that we have. This is a rising junior, she's wonderful. And then our IT and libraries team are helping us. So um, when you go to the web page, there's an about the COVID information Commons. So you can go in there and actually watch a little video to see what it's all about. It's what I basically told you. <laughs> and then there's a user tutorial video, which is eight or nine minutes. And it's really detailed because it's kind of a complex tool, one of them. But let me show you quickly how you would use this. And you can have these charts, I can send them. They're just fat because there are a lot of screenshots. <laughs> so it's kind of big. And they're gonna be, um, actually the webinar is gonna be posted on our website that we had yesterday to launch this. So here you would go, click these icons to find NSF rapid grants. It could be biological sciences, geosciences, social behavioral. We're gonna go into office of the director. When you click on that, you get to this simple search. We call this simple, I know, but that's what NSF has had for many, many years. And so you can see it's in the office of the director. COVID and RAPID, if you're in here, it's Boolean, all caps, and. And here you can see, oh, this is the award that actually funded the COVID Info Commons. If you click on that, you get all this abstract information. You know, the abstract, the PI, the email address for ease of collaboration. Now, if you go into the COVID Research Explorer tool, this is when things get interesting. <laughs> so when you first go into it, there's this topographical map that you get. And this is an assessment of all the COVID and coronavirus related awards, because that's the query we put in by NSF. And where you see more depth, there are more awards. So here you can see social distancing is a very big topic area. Disease spread, social media, 
And as you know, with data, the interesting thing is what you see and what you don't see, right? So these are the thematic areas that um, a number of the NSF awards in, um, in COVID and coronavirus are, are talking about and what they're working on. Then it makes you think, well, what isn't there? Right now, if you actually, you know, go deeper into the website, you know, the more words will come out. But it makes you think, like, what about mutation? What about virology? You know, I wonder if that's in there. So for NSF, it lets them think about: Do we want to focus on certain areas that we're not addressing yet? And then for researchers, it could allow them to do the same thing. So if you go from the map to the tree map, you get this really cool kaleidoscope, <laughs> which is a clustered view of the awards. And if you go a little bit deeper, you can actually say, well, how can I look at this data so it's usable? So you click on these little cogs and then you can color by state, size by amount. I like to do it that way so I know how much money people got. Label by institution, I like to know what institutions are doing what, and then I highlight the same color. So how does that manifest? Well, this is how I wanna see the information. It's a polygonal view. If you choose rectangular, it's like the periodic table of the elements, but like a whole bunch of them together. Um, and um, you could, I'll show you how I put PI in here sometime too. For any of the awards, if you click on any of these little polygons, you would actually get this information on the right. You can customize this. So here's the title of the award, the award number, the amount of money, US dollars, the institution, the PI and co-PI and their email addresses in the state they're in and their abstract. And you can customize that and I'll show you how. So let's say we're on this and we click on one of these awards. In this case, I click on Cornell. And because I said by state and that I want to have colors by state, if I click on Cornell, it's in the state of New York, all the New York awards light up. Very interesting. So if I'm actually doing work in New York, I might say, ah, who else is in New York? Not that we can see each other right now too much, you know, but that might be an interesting local collaboration opportunity. Here's California, same idea. You click on one, you see a bunch. Then what you could do is you can change this from institution to PI. You know, maybe you say, okay, that's interesting with those institutions, but who are these humans? Like, oh, Sunny, oh, wow, we were postdocs together. That's kind of cool. What's Sunny up to now, right? So you can actually see the humans. And then you click on Sunny, and then you can also see the other research, um, the other PIs and co-PIs in the state of California where Sunny is. And here you can see the work that Sunny is doing. Very interesting. Let's say you just wanted to look at your state, and this is currently just US, as I said. So state, pencil, you have to learn the, you know, the Boolean a little bit, all capitals, and use your parentheses well. And uh, state, you know, colon Pennsylvania, and these are all the awards in Pennsylvania. And here you can see we customized the right a little bit to say, since I'm looking at a lot of awards at once, I just want a little tiny abstract that can always make it bigger later. I just want to be able to page through and see what they have. So here's Pennsylvania as an example. Here's Maryland. I like to be equal, equal with all our regions in the US. And then what if I was at Columbia? Oh, and I am. And somebody asked me, who's getting these at Columbia? If you put in Columbia, what comes up is Columbia University. But because of the way the algorithm, you know, machine learning, it's a beautiful thing, right? It decides what it wants to tell you and how to tell you. It actually chooses other institutions with the word Columbia. So there's the University of Missouri at Columbia. But if you know you mean Columbia University, you just click on that. And once again, it lights up, you know, everything in that state. So what you can also do is query by topic. So you could put here, like if you wanted to look at knowledge graphs as an example, you put and knowledge and graph, our lovely Boolean, and then you get that. And this is a, a PI and co-PI view. Very interesting. You say, well, this is interesting, but I know, I don't even, who are they and where are they? So then you can actually go in, once again, your little cogs, and you change it and say, well, show me the institution instead of the PI name. And you go, oh, UCSD. Oh, Ilya's at UCSD. Oh, Yuri's at Stanford now. Oh, that's kind of cool. You know, so you can actually find them. And once again, if you click on any of them, you get this abstract on there, right? And you get all their information. You can ask their email address as well. Here we changed another one, a different topic, mutation. I was working with uh, Vince Poor, who's actually a friend of mine at Princeton. I went to Princeton and uh, he has an award. He's one of our PIs. And so he actually said, you know, I'm working on mutation, but I'm like an electrical engineering computer science guy. So I know all the WECS stuff going on and, you know, the right journals and everything. But now I'm, you know, using network technology and looking at how that manifests in mutation 
a virology, very different. So he said, I need to find other people working on mutations so I can meet the people doing this from like the biology and bioinformatics side so that we can work together. Very interesting. So we put in mutation, look at all of these awards. How cool, he can make all these new friends. And when you go over here to the field side on each of these pages, you can actually say, well, what do I wanna see in the abstract over here? I want the title, I want the abstract. Show that as the body. Um, I want the amount and the institution, the PI and email way at the top so it like jumps out at me in the state that they're in. And so you can customize that as you see fit. So, so that's the different ways that you would do that. Then let's say, you know, I went to Princeton, so I'm like, oh, what's Princeton doing? So I click on Princeton, I go, oh, Vince, that's right, that's what he said he was doing, that's really cool. Now if you were Vince, you would look and say, you know, these are the colors once again in the same state. And you say, oh wow, Rutgers, that's right up the block. How cool is that? I should click on that and see who that PI is and see if maybe we can work together. So there are a bunch of uh, PIs. You can see they're like 800 awards with the, 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 rap, the COVID rapids, which are like rapid um, response grants and other COVID grants. Uh, we had our kickoff webinar, launch webinar yesterday. We had two of the PIs present. And um, we actually asked, does anybody want to do a five minute lightning talk? I, I begged Peter to do it from UCSD. And then we had 39 other PIs who offered. I'm like, oh my gosh, who knew we were gonna be so popular? So the, these folks uh, presented yesterday and this presentation will be on our website. We're gonna be sending that out. And then we have 38 more that are gonna be doing upcoming talks. We're gonna create a COVID information commons community and having follow on webinars. So um, I'll show you if you wanna get in involved in that and how you participate. We're trying to go by FAIR principles. All this data is now more easily findable and accessible through this website. We're making the humans interoperable through the Slack channel and through the info, uh, COVID Info Commons community. And then we'll see where it goes with using open knowledge networks and helping data sets connect. And if the information is all reusable. You can download spreadsheets, CSV files, whatever, and use it all you want. The other thing I want to mention is that the Northeast Big Data Hub we actually have a COVID-19 resources page. And on here we have funding opportunities and they're actually around the planet. Um, there's actually an NSF International COVID-19 funding initiative spreadsheet. Um, there's NIH, there's AWS, Google, NSF, a lot of different foundations. We have a list of organizations and networks, Bodon you may have heard of, Virus Outbreak Data Network, um, and some of the others here. And we also have data sets. And they're from around the planet because people know we have this, so they send us these links. So these are the US data sets. We have a few European data sets. They had me present this on an EC meeting a few weeks ago, and um, they asked me to put the European Bioinformatics Institute data portal on here, so that's here. Uh, we have a couple of Australian data sets. We have an African data set. How cool is that? And then we have guides and references, and these are all hot links from our page. Um, so um, I would say use it, share it. Anybody around the planet can use it. You can join our Slack channel if you want. That's the bit.ly. Um, if you'd like to be in our COVID Information Commons community, you can send us an email address, um, an email at info at covidinfocommons.net. That's our generic. And uh, that goes to all four big data hub executive directors. And if you know someone that would like to do a lightning talk, they could, um, we're gonna send out a little survey on that or they can email us. And then we plan on putting a proposed link to the International Fair Convergence Symposium um, organized by CoData and GoFair. Um, and I already had one or two PIs who said they'd like to present with us. So I wanna get more um, so we can put it in as a team. Um, and then there's the ADSA meeting as well that people could sign up for. And that's it. Great, thank that very wonderful presentation, wonderful work. Thank you very much, Florence, for coming in and sharing that with us. Um, I already want to make sure I know if you could send me the slides afterwards, I would appreciate it. We've already had a couple of people in the Slack channel uh, asking the, uh, if they could see the slides. So I, I can, if you send me them, I can post them. Or you're, I know you're on the Slack channel now, so you can post them there too. Yeah, I am. I just joined. Yeah, that's what I figured. I wasn't going to present everything, but all the PI lightning talks, actually, there are hot links to all the awards if you wanted to check them out. So I figured if I gave you it all, then you can play with it. So I'll PDF it and send it to you. So it'll be a little bit smaller, but it's like this big. <laughs> Fair enough. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, does anybody have any questions or uh, comments or uh, you would like to, to give? You can uh, either post into the, the chat uh, window or you can go ahead and unmute and ask questions. Okay, ask a question. So it's a very nice research machine, but this can, I mean, uh, this, uh, this uh, 
It's not limited only to COVID. You can do for any project the topic. You know? So this is just an additional word, and then you can search through all I don't know what kind of topics you could have. Of course, the the page the the page is then related to COVID, but in fact you can then search through all the PIs and get uh, connection on any topic that you want. Isn't it like that? Isn't that amazing? Yeah, so we, um, we've been told to say that we are focusing on the COVID rapid awards, mm -hmm. um, but smarty pants like you figure that out. You're the first one to say it out loud, <laughs> but that might be changing. They might actually throttle it on the back end, mm -hmm. um, but it's all public award information. It doesn't go into like the proposal database and stuff like that at NSF. They have us, it's just all the public information, but you're right, but do it quickly because it might change and don't tell anybody. Oh, you're going to post this. <laughs> So we, I'm not. We do gather a smart group of people here. So you do, but yeah, it is. But but the project is focused on COVID. So um, you know, because we really need to accelerate the work that we're doing in this area. Even God willing, if we do get a vaccine soon, there's going to be other stuff that happens. There'll be other pandemics. This will keep morphing. You know, as we get better at precision medicine, we have to figure stuff out. And as you know, I, you know, I'm also. Uh, as an example, you know, DOE is working and CERN is working with the National Cancer Institute, right? So I'm on the, the steering committee for the Computational Approaches for Cancer Workshop at SC every year, working with NCI, the National Cancer Institute, and we're trying to get the algorithm assist from DOE to help the medical and health professionals figure out how to look at their data. And as you know, I mean, if I were to go wide, when I look at this and I say, well, you know, some cancers are caused by a virus and we can't cure things, you can't cure cancer, the cold is caused by a virus and we can't cure the common cold. And the coronavirus is a virus. Oh my gosh, what's the pattern? Oh, they're all a virus. If we could figure one of these suckers out, I wonder if we'll get insight that can help more broadly. And so that's why I really, I, I really believe in this convergent multidisciplinary research so you can have thoughts like that. It's not just your little thing, right? And then also knowing how to leverage the data. Great. And if you know query tools like you do, you little smarty pants. So, um, you know, then you can find all sorts of stuff. So I would, we would be happy for any input you have. You can send an email to me or to info at covidinfocommons.net. You can do the feedback form on the homepage. And NSF is asking us, what are people, what do you want to do next? I said, well, I want to ask the humans what they need. Uh, you know, because if you follow the humans, they follow you, I noticed. I was in, at IBM for many, many years, and so I always started with the client. So if you have thoughts on what you'd like to see, um, you know, as we look at this query tool, are there other databases you wish it went against? Um, do we create, and we're looking at creating a newer front end that's a little simpler. Um, you know, it's great that you know query tools and, and can use it, not everyone there is there. But if there is someone that wants to learn how to use it more, the user tutorial video is me actually, I, not my face, but me going through a live demo, making mistakes, not using my parentheses correctly, and showing how to get out of it, because that's one of the issues if you don't know Boolean, you know, of how you actually um, create the query. So that's all in the user tutorial video too. So yes, thank you for your question and comment. And thank you for diving in so quickly. I'm so excited. Thank you. Any other questions? Sean, may I make a question? Yeah, please. Oh, Florence, thank you very much for the clear presentation. I'm very, I'm, I have a very fresh question is, uh, uh, which, which are the sources of the data that you uh, include in your, your uh, I mean, uh, the project, so I'm, I'm curious now just to know where you take the data. And in addition, if you also cover the European uh, institution or databases, a project database, whatever it is. Thank you. Very good question. I have three answers for you. So um, the current tools go against the NSF award database, the public information you can find about any of those NSF COVID or otherwise awards. Um, we also have information from the PIs on these awards, 167 of the PIs so far, and we've asked them for their ORCID ID, links to their GitHub site, their projects, whatever. So what we're looking to do now in phase two, which we promised to do by October, is to figure out how to get that, those links into the site so that you can actually find the current data about what's really going on with the research. So that's the second piece of it. And the third piece is we, the only database we go against right now is the NSF award database, but we're very interested in what you think would be valuable. 
It could be a European data set. It could be an African data set. It could be an NIH data set. We want to know what you think would be most valuable. And you can email me or that info at covidinfocommons.net, put it in the feedback form on the homepage, any, any of those three mechanisms, I'll get it. And we're looking at what do we want the next set to be? Because NSF has been asking us, what do you want to do next? But as I said, I want, to, I want to do what the humans need. You know, what is it that's going to help you? And you know, like, you know, don't worry about this data set. This is the one, you know, like, you know, that kind of stuff. So I would love to know that. And we're, you know, we're looking at, should we do our next, you know, NSF is like, do you want to put a proposal in now? I'm like, ah, you know, I don't know what I need yet. Let me get this thing launched, you know, because we just got this award in May. It's like less than two months and we launched it. So we're like, you know, our hair is on fire, as you say, you know, or as we say, um, you know, so now we can start getting this really great input and I would love to be able to do it. It's going to make it more complicated. It's going to be more expensive. I'm going to be a data center manager. It'll be like a CIO again. Oh my gosh. You know, like we have to figure out how all this stuff connects. Um, but I'd love, I'd love to do it. I know on the EC call, they were very interested in continuing the collaboration. So um, I would be happy to hear what you guys want. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. I think we do need to, to, to move on, but uh, Florence is in the Slack channel and I'm sure we can continue the discussions uh, uh, after, the, after the meeting that way. I do want to make a, just a general announcement too, is this, this meeting, I see some people forwarding the invites to people as we're doing the meeting, which is great because this is open to everyone. So, you know, feel free to tell your friends, uh, you know, about this meeting. If you find it useful, uh, please invite them to come uh, um, and it would be it would be great to get more people uh, involved. Uh, we're really open. Doesn't matter what country you're from, what you're doing in, in terms of COVID research. If you think it's useful, please have them. Please invite them in to join us. And we're happy to have updates from all sorts of different uh, uh, projects. So please, uh, uh, thanks. And I yes, I will send. Uh, uh, the, I'll send. I can send you an invite uh, back out so that everybody can do that. Um, Okay, great. So let's go ahead and move on to our next talk. Uh, I'll turn it over to Matei to introduce our next speaker. Okay, hey, I'm going to leave. Thanks a lot, you guys. I'll, Thank you very much, Florence, for joining us. I'll try to put it in the Slack channel. I hope I don't break it. It's kind of big. If I, okay. It'll be fine. <laughs> okay, I'll get it to you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day and be well. Thank you. So our next speaker is Vittorio Limongeli. He is professor in computational biology and Pharmacology and Director of the Competence Center in Life Sciences, University of Lugano, Switzerland. So, Vittorio, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Matei, for the present nice presentation. Uh, let me just, okay, share my screen with you. Can you see mm -hmm. my presentation? Yep. It's full screen for you? Yes, yep. Okay, good. perfect, perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay, so first of all, thank you everybody for inviting me to present some uh, new results, I would say very preliminary results re regarding our project. We are a small group in Lugano that works in computational pharmacology, drug design, computer simulations on biological systems. And the project we are, I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about today is called REDAC, which is Repositionary Drugs Against COVID-19. And uh, it's a very, very, um, I would say, standard project on drug design. And uh, we are going to see the details right in a, in a couple of slides to understand the rationale behind this project that was also funded by uh, Praise. And uh, thanks to this resource, we are using the competition of time on, uh, at CSCS in Lugano to run our simulations. In addition, it's under revision for the Swiss National Science Foundation uh, for funding uh, and providing money to do experiments as well to validate our in silico results. Let's go to uh, present the project very briefly. So as a pharmacologist, the question is how to fight against SARS-CoV-2, which is the main, <laughs> one of the main questions that, that we face in, this, in these months. And we have basically, uh, for people that are not familiar with pharmacology, uh, basically two ways. One is vaccine. I'm not, I'm not going to talk about vaccines. It's a way in order to, to, you know, to provide the, the immunity against this virus. It's very debated. We have some promising results, but again, it's not the topic of this presentation. And the other ways to, of course, identify a new drugs, medicine, that are able to, um, of course, block, no? block the virus uh, cell replication or, in way, or at least alleviate no? the uh, hyperinflammation uh, that is induced by the virus in the host uh, uh, in, the, in the host um, 
individuals. Uh, well, uh, we, are, uh, we are treating uh, the, the second part, so we decided to uh, contribute to this research when I was uh, uh, invited by many collaborators to present a project on SARS-CoV-2. At the beginning, I was very uh, skeptical because I'm not familiar with this virus. And there are a lot of good immunologists and also virologists that are more expert than me in this topic. But after some uh, weeks that I continue to study literature, I think uh, it's, it's important that all of us contribute to this emergency and uh, uh, singular no? uh, situation that we faced uh, worldwide. So I decided with my groups to also give my contribution and give a, use our expertise in uh, trying to identify new drugs against COV-2. And to do so, we want, when we want to develop a new drugs, you have to decide the strategy. If we want to proceed from scratch, identify new drugs, uh, new molecules that are active against, against any molecular targets of the virus, of course, the it's an interesting way, but it's a very long way that may lead you to identify new drugs in 10 or 20 years. And of course, this is a good strategy, but it's not answering the uh, current urgency, the urgency that we have of finding in the shortest time some therapeutics uh, to uh, face and to tackle with the emergency that we are, we are having uh, in the world. So the alternative way to do that is drug depositioning and drug repositioning or, or also called drug repurposing is another way to perform drug discovery, which means that you study the uh, drugs that are already on the market, so approved for other therapeutic issues, and try to see if you can reposition these drugs towards some molecular targets that are involved in the virus infection. To do so, of course, you have to use anyway uh, in silico experimental techniques, and we are going to talk about this in the, in the next slides. And, but then the process, of course, is shorter because you can skip the uh, phase one clinical trial, but also the phase zero, so called phase zero clinical trial, so you can skip the safety uh, check of this drug because, because you are considered drugs already on the market, so these are supposed to be safe, and uh, you can just check if the dosage, the dose, the, the, the quantity, and the, 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 of course, the pharmacological activity that you attribute to these drugs are validated, so in the next uh, later phases of clinical trials, which are phase uh, two and phase three clinical trials, and then we have the post-marketing phase four. So drug repositioning is very well performed, can leave, lead you to identify new possible market drugs against the virus in a uh, few months, one or two years, no more. And this is exactly what is the goal of the REDAC, our project. So our project REDAC has the objective very clear to identify marketed drugs for COVID-19 in two years. This is a project that was uh, as I told you, submitted to uh, Swiss National Foundation. And with the praise in the first year, we have this important amount of computational resource that we will use to provide the first preliminary results, the first preliminary prediction of the activity of the market drugs towards different molecular targets of the, uh, the SARS-CoV-2. And then in the second year, we are going to validate these results with experiments in a collaboration with a, a number of groups that we identify in the world that can help us to, to achieve finally uh, ca drug candidates to enter in the phase two clinical trials. So the key words or the, I would say the, the, the key sentences of the project are that we are going, we are using right now, we are currently using in, in, in these hours the simulation running fast and furious that this drug discovery, which means don't use, we are specialized in developing also advanced computational free energy calculations, but in this case, we just use the more standard, uh, faster techniques so we don't want to use um, any special or even, 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 even if this may be ac more accurate, but we don't want to use computational intensive techniques, but we want to have results as, as soon as possible. So a kind of quick and dirt approach, and this is enough. And this will be applied to structure-based drug discovery. So we decided to uh, target key molecular targets for which we know the 3D structures of, of the proteins and uh, using a stable methodology, both in terms of in silico calculation, which means I will see in a few slides, uh, docking calculation, molecular dynamics, and uh, also some free energy calculation well established with a method that we develop in our lab, and also established experimental techniques. So no, 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 no methodology innovation is, is, is foreseen in this kind of project because we don't have time. We want to discover the drugs as soon as possible. So just to go directly to the, the, the overall picture of the project, we identify five, important molecular targets 
in the virus in the COVID-19, so in the virus infection. The first one is very well known, is the angiotensin converting enzyme 2, that is the first recognition site of the virus through the spike protein on the, on the cell membrane. It's, uh, so it's, it is thought, even though there's no drugs that have been uh, is, is be found, uh, at least not potent uh, enough to go into clinical trials, that it's a good no, molecular target in order to impede the virus to enter into the, into the, into the host cell. And this is supposed to be a good target to block no, the infection in the phase one, which is the very early phase of the infection, or also in the prophylactic, prophylactic case, which want to avoid the first contact between the virus. Suppose that you have a person that has been in contact with a people, with some, some, somebody that was infected, you can provide, in principle, this, uh, these drugs and to avoid that the virus will be spread in the host person. Then we have um, a second target, which is the main protease of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And this is important proteins of the virus, which is a viral protein. So it's not an host protein, it's a viral protein. And it's important because this uh, main protease is, main protease cleaves important viral and uh, non-structural protein of the virus. So it's important for the whole uh, self uh, left pan of the virus. So if we block the activity of this main protease, we are going to block many uh, following activities, uh, many uh, like uh, the replication of RNA of the virus and other, other um, functional proteins that are important to the creation of the variants. In doing so, we are blocking the virus, the virus uh, activity. Then also we have another important target, very well known for people that work in drug design in this field. Uh, on this virus is the RNA dependent RNA polymerase, and uh, the name is very simple. So it's 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 uh, devoted. So it it is uh, this enzyme is used by the virus to replicate the var the viral RNA. So if we block this, we are blocking the replication of the virus in the cell. In addition, we have another interesting target, which is the two prime O -met uh, methyl transferase enzyme. That is an important uh, molecular target with a peculiar mechanism. It's responsible for capping the viral DNA while, once it is replicated. And in doing so, it allows the viral RNA to elude the uh, host immune system. So if we block this enzyme, the uh, viral RNA is no longer capped and is more ex exposed to the uh, aggression, to the, rep to the, res the answer of the uh, human immune system. Uh, in doing so, of course, we are favoring the host, no? The, we are favoring uh, the human host, no? To, 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 to at least to keep, to keep under control the viral infection. The last one is an interesting uh, G-protein couple receptor, which is the mitochondrial uh, assembly uh, receptor uh, one. And uh, this uh, GPCR is the final target of the angiotensin 1-7 ligand. That was, that one is coming from the H2, the angiotensin converting enzyme that is in, if this is involved in the interaction with the spike protein, the first recognition site with the SARS-CoV-2, of course, the uh, system, so the axis between H2 and Jurotensin 1.7 and MAS-1 receptor is under-regulated. So in doing so, this means that uh, in particular in the airway epithelial cell, this receptor plays an important role in the upper inflammation uh, phase induced by the virus. And if we provide, if we discover an agonist of the receptor, we are able to recover somehow, no? the, the, the physiological, the homostatic activity of the epithelia, uh, airway epithelial cell, and so we are uh, contracting the severe clinical uh, consequence of the virus that occurs during the inf infection phase 2B and 3. So it's the later and, uh, phases of the, of the virus infection, which is also characterized by the most severe, um, uh, severe uh, effects, symptomatology in, in, the, in the host cell. So the computational methodology is very simple. I don't want to go too much into the details. So if people are interested, we can go later on in some chatting or discussion together. It's a standard virtual screening in which the database that we consider, as already mentioned before, are drugs already approved in the market. Not only drugs, but also nutraceutical and that are supplementary. So we include everything that is available and approved by FDA, EMA, and other agencies worldwide, so we take together all the nutraceutical uh, dietary supplements and the drugs already approved. We, we are studying, currently studying these um, uh, drugs in all the uh, targets that I presented before. We do some pre-doc and filtering, uh, Lipinski rule, other uh, 
uh, technology and uh, methodology details that I don't want to enter to in detail right now. Then we perform docking, analysis of deposits, and important thing that we, we include also, we add our expertise in the post-docking feature phases in which we are, we are going to, to perform uh, unbiased so standard molecular dynamics simulations to, in order to validate you know, the docking results because we know that docking, docking calculations are affected by very uh, poor, weak, no? A sensitivity, a selectivity. So in this sense, we need to validate the docking post that present many false positives. And in doing so, we use unbiased molecular dynamics simulation, but also free energy calculations. So we, in this sense, we are using fundamental dynamics that is a method that we develop in our group in Lugano. And uh, I'm going to present the fundamental dynamics with just two slides in a, in a couple of seconds. And in addition, we also are using a machine learning technique in order to be able to identify drugs uh, studied uh, by this protocol that are able to interact with more than one target. Why we added this, this additional step? Because drug repurposing that, or drug repositioning was already uh, used in several pharma pharmaceutical uh, studies. And in most of the cases, uh, drug repurposing is able also to lead to, uh, to, to lead the identification of, of weak ligands. So ligands that have high activity in the low nano macromolar range towards a molecular target, and so these are not useful no? to proceed uh, to complete the, the clinical trials. So uh, since in the, in the best scenario, we are going to identify drugs that are active towards our targets in the macromolar range, it would be very interesting to identify drugs that are able to, 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 to target, to have activity to against more than one of the investigated targets. And so these are try to identify multi-target drugs uh, in the, uh, against these five uh, molecular targets. And to do that, we are using a machine learning protocols in order, to, uh, in particular, neural network uh, model in which we are going to reproduce our binding modes, identify possible common features between binding modes that we have identified through, uh, by means of docking calculation, molecular dynamics, and fundamental dynamics. Fundamental dynamics is very uh, new, Bunny French technique we developed in 2013 and recently on issue protocol, we also provide a protocol that allows to perform this Bunny French calculation in a very straightforward and user-friendly manner, then, uh, in enhancing and improving the setup and the, uh, the running phase and also the analysis of the calculation. Uh, it's very simple. The, uh, the drug that you see here is a red stick uh, against the molecular target that I show as cartoon just to simulate the binding and binding of the decan towards this receptor. At the end, you can compute very accurately the binding constant. This means that you are able to compute the binding fringe, so the strength, the power, the ability to bind of the decan towards its molecular target. This is just a sample uh, an animation to show you how this uh, method works. So for the most interesting binding modes that we identified by docking calculations, we are going to validate the binding modes using this uh, French calculation in which you can see the ligand that, that leaves, so it binds the target and then binds several times in doing so. You are describing the binding process as, the, as it is, because binding process is a dynamic process, it's not, it's not a static process. In doing so, you are taking into account the barriers, uh, alternative binding modes, solvation, because there is water also present in simulations, uh, kinetic trap, whatever it is important in order to try to uh, understand in, in a more comprehensive and accurate way, the binding mechanism of the most interesting drugs towards the targets that we are where we decided to investigate. The code is freely available on my website. The inputs are also available on the Plumenet uh, website that we published last year on issue methods with other guys that contribute to the development of the proven software. That is a software that uh, is a a plugin that can be plugged in the most commonly used molecular dynamic codes like Amber, Gromax, and AMD, and you can perform this type of, of, of calculation with your preferred AMD code. Just going towards the end of my presentation, I would like to share with you the very first fresh preliminary results that we achieved on the first target, which is the angiotensin converting enzyme 2. And we have already identified 23 drug candidates that we are going to, ex, uh, to test experimentally in the following weeks, uh, two months, following weeks. And we target, first of all, this is the complex between the spike protein, the virus spike protein shown in green, and the ACE2 shown in uh, pink. And we identify binding pocket uh, facing you know, the interaction site between the spike and the, and the ACE2. 
and we targeted this binding pocket. In doing so, we have identified potential uh, 23 uh, drug candidates. I'll show you just a simulation of one of the most promising one. So this is uh, 500 in a second, but because as I told you, the simulation was extended, it's, it's running right now while I'm speaking, the simulation continues. As you can see, after a uh, first equilibration uh, phase, in the end, the, 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 um, the, the ligand that I don't show the structure for the child region is able to find uh, the final binding mode that is stable there and it allows to make very stable interaction with the protein. As you can see here uh, on the x axis, I show the residues in the binding site. And you can see the percentage, the residence time, the, per, uh, the, pers uh, the persistence of the interaction between the ligand and the, these residues of the binding site are very high for key. Uh, ligand, the key residue that are involved in the interaction with the spike protein. In doing so, we hope that we are able to block no, with this ligand uh, the ACE2 uh, protein in a in conformation not competent for the binding of the spike. In doing so, we are doing a kind of, um, we we'll say, um, um, blocking of the enzyme that is, uh, can be used, for instance, in prophylaxis therapy or in the very first no, stages of the infections. And this is just on this, on this target that I, uh, I want to share the information. We also have results on the other targets, but probably this will be argument of the uh, next update on this project that I will share with you in the next months. So let me just conclude, first of all, uh, acknowledging uh, the, 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 the funding from the praise that is fundamental for us. Otherwise, we just perform the docking calculation. We cannot go into more details. It allows us to screen a lot the docking results and have um, more accurate uh, data and uh, reliable drug candidates to test experimentally. And also the Swiss National Supercomputing Center on which we are running these simulations. Of course, my teammates, so my group and uh, the person that actually are responsible of the hard work, simulation setup or the things we discuss weekly uh, the updates, but these are really the, the pillars of, of this research, very brave and uh, good uh, scientists, and of course, the experimentalist collab uh, experimental collaborators that for the moment are not involved in the project, but with them, we are created a team. And as you can see, we have uh, important collaborators and important names in the field of the COVID research, like Carla Satchel in the States, Northwestern University of Chicago, or Rolf Ingefen, University of Lübeck, Germany, and Nicolas Terjopoulos, Epifel in Lausanne, that works on the MAS1 receptor and for the ACE2 enzyme, the, the biochemical assay will be performed uh, in Italy by the Professor Perucci, uh, Professor Fiorucci at the University of Perugia. And uh, for, with this, I finish it and I'm um, open to answer to your question. Great, thanks, Victoria. That was uh, that was wonderful. Great, great results. Uh, and thanks for uh, coming and presenting the update to us. We'll look forward to your next update. Um, in the interest of time, we're going to have to forego questions because I do want to give uh, Jonathan uh, enough time to give his uh, his update as well. So uh, please feel free to join in on the Slack or the email list to ask some uh, questions and uh, comments to Vittorio. But, but thank you very much, Vittorio, for coming and presenting to us. That was awesome. My pleasure. Okay, so our final presentation uh, today is from uh, Jonathan Fuchs. Fuchs, did I say it right? You did, yeah. All right, Fuchs, uh, from, he's, he's a research associate from the Institute of Computational Biomedicine at the Wheel uh, Cornell Medicine in the USA. So uh, please uh, take it away, gentlemen. Sure thing. Let's see here. All right. Um, can you see the couple mm -hmm. slides I've put up? Great. So yeah, thank you for the invitation. This is a really wonderful knowledge exchange. I'm happy to be a part of it. And I'm happy to share a brief update on some of the work that as you can see, not just I, but a large team of people from around the country have been working on. Um, this has been um, work that has come out of um, the collaboration between the Institute for Computational Biomedicine here at Well Cornell, uh, as well as our pathology department, that really started um, as the pandemic was you know, beginning here in New York City. And we were interested in doing a number of things. Um, in the first place, we wanted at the time to help develop a color, uh, colorometric um, assay for uh, detecting SARS-CoV-2 from nasopharyngeal swabs. And we worked closely with our pathology department to get 
I think it was a total of 857 samples from about 750 patients that were coming through our hospital system. Um, and we wanted to leverage those swabs, not just, sorry, here we go. This is the sort of um, overview of the paper, uh, which I should also mention, um, we put up on BioArchive um, and you know I can send out the link to the group. Uh, we're currently um, undergoing revisions. So there are some updates that we're incorporating um, as we discover new things day by day. But essentially, as I mentioned, we developed this colorimetric assay uh, loop mediated isothermal amplification or LAMP to be able to detect the um, envelope or the uh, nucleocapsid gene in the specimen. Um, and we, as I mentioned, captured that from nasopharyngeal swabs, as well as at the time we wanted to swab, well, you know, how much transmission are we potentially getting from um, surfaces in the subway system, which was a really scary idea at the time. Uh, spoiler alert, from the 86 um, specimens we collected from Grand Central, Times Square, really, heavily populated uh, subway stations. We didn't detect the virus um, in any appreciable sense. Uh, we just didn't see it, which was reassuring, but also important from a research perspective. Um, so not only do we describe in this paper um, this assay for rapid detection, um, but we also did um, random uh, shotgun RNA sequencing uh, and some meta-transcriptomics um, to deconvolute not just um, what is the virus that we're detecting in these swabs and how well can we reconstruct their genome and sort of describe the um, viral clade diversification in New York City and in context of viruses sequenced around the world, but also from the host side of things, what is happening in the patient um, in their immune system? How are they responding differently? So again, what you're seeing here is a project overview, the sort of three different assays that we focused on. Um, we spent a fair amount of time uh, seeing, you know, what is the vir um, limit of detection of the virus through LAMP? Um, what is the sort of sensitivity and specificity? Fortunately, it's quite good, and we're hoping um, to uh, implement it in labs around the country. From the virus side of things, we saw a lot of really neat things. Um, I just want to summarize the, the most interesting, perhaps, is that we saw an enrichment of certain variants with respect to the viral genome. Um, so. Uh, within New York City, well, Cornell, New York Presbyterian samples. So we see the sort of what we thought of as sort of an expansion of um, particular variants, um, uh, major alleles that are present in these viruses. We don't necessarily see any functional difference or um, infective difference, but it's interesting to see the sort of um, uh, effect as the virus uh, diversified in, in our city. Um, and we contextualize that within the, the GIS aid uh, global landscape of viruses sequenced. And from the host immune side of things, uh, we were able to not just stratify all of our different samples by um, viral load and level of infection, but we were able to run um, the RNA-seq um, NF core pipeline. And this sort of ties into um, the resources provided by Exceed a lot of this work where we not just um, deconvoluted the reads that came from this metatranscriptomic shotgun approach into reads that are definitely human, um, definitely SARS-CoV-2, some other virus or other um, microbial eukaryotic uh, taxa, but we ran a lot of these um, pipelines to align the human reads to the human reference, to run a uh, differential gene expression and so forth on the um, resources provided by the large memory nodes at Exceed. So we're really fortunate to have that partnership. What I'm showing here again is just one uh, sort of summary slide of differences of expression of uh, particular, um, th these genes that are implicated in the immune response to the virus uh, stratified by either no presence of the virus, low, medium, or high presence, uh, so, you know, low, medium, or high titer, or perhaps other uh, pneumatic viral infections that we could detect in the samples. And we've been asked a lot by collaborators, well, you know, how much of this data is available? How much can we look at? And one really neat thing that has come out since we posted this paper on BioArchive is an interactive website that we encourage um, anyone to be able to go to. Um, we, we sort of have this um, portal or this resource for folks to 
dive into the data we provided um, what we're calling COVID-19 genes, right? So if you're interested in a certain gene or a certain pathway to see if it's enriched or upregulated, uh, you can just type in whatever you want, um, interactively, dynamically see um, what did we detect in these um, samples from these patients, uh, both from just NGS sequencing, uh, how many reads were matched to SARS-CoV-2 from RT-PCR, uh, how many cycles did we need to detect the virus, um, how do we classify the viral load in our patients, and so on and so forth. Um, so, you know, as a summary, we, we have kind of two major arms of this analysis, both from the viral side of things and from the host immune response side of things. Um, and we're happy to provide a sort of public facing resource for um, other researchers to um, mine and perhaps build upon. And just to reiterate, a lot of this work was uh, done, a lot of the compute was done uh, thanks to the resources that exceed. So, you know, we're looking forward to continuing this uh, partnership. There's a lot more data. Uh, every day we seem to um, have more data, whether it's um, uh, metadata from EHR records uh, that we, you know, had to spend a lot of time uh, sorting out IRB permissions or um, additional sequencing from other NP swabs and so on and so forth. So this is a continued partnership and this is a, um, an ever-growing project and uh, I'm happy to, um, you know, if anybody's interested in helping out uh, computationally or just um, ideal, you know, in terms of ideas for going forward, uh, we're happy to work with the uh, Knowledge Exchange Program here. And yeah, thanks again for your time and I'm happy to take questions here or after this call. Great, thanks, John. That's awesome. I, I actually, it's a, an interesting topic in my mind. I was a part of a study back in H1N1 uh, during the H1N1 pandemic and looking at the um, potential mitigation strategies with uh, public transit in New York City. Uh, it was a paper that was uh, uh, first offered by a man named Phil Cooley, who was a mentor of mine. Uh, it, was, it was interesting. I mean, we were considered, we were kind of considering what would happen if we shut down the subway system. Uh, in the middle of a, res uh, a major respiratory pandemic, um, as you might guess, it had, would have a big effect. Um, but the, the um, it's an interesting paper if you ever get a chance to read it. Um, not not yeah. to do any genetic testing or anything. We were just looking at it was an agent-based model with the uh, a model of respiratory spread in different uh, different uh, sectors of the community and stuff. No, that's that's actually really interesting. I'd love to see that. And yeah, you know, back in March and early April, we were so worried about fomite transmission and to what extent is that the way that the virus is primarily exchanged. Now it's become a little bit more clear that it's mostly aerosolized droplet-based transmission. So um, it's interesting to see how research like ours or like yours can inform uh, our understanding of how viruses are spread. Yeah, yeah, we didn't we we didn't include in the model any explicit fomite track because in influenza that's uh, certainly a matter of very fervent debate, mostly on the side of it. It doesn't really have much of a fomite transmission. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I mean, I, I know we're at time, but if anybody has any questions, I'm willing to uh, we, we can keep it open. If anybody wants to ask Jonathan a question, please fill. You can uh, put it in the chat window or unmute and ask. And, you know, while we have one more moment, I just want to also point out that um, in addition to this group here, there's also the Covert COV International mm -hmm. Research Team, um, uh, led by um, some of the folks at NASA and some other mm -hmm. major labs, um, and I think some of the folks on the call here as well, um, that have been taking not just our data, but other um, NP swab data sets. And uh, there's an ongoing effort to uh, sequence and run through many of the same pipelines that we implemented here. So. There is a lot of room, not just to work on these data, but other data that are coming in uh, seemingly every day. So. Yeah, awesome. Uh, yeah, actually, Ashvin uh, was here last, or Ashvin was here last week, oh, or last uh, yeah. meeting, telling us about Covert. And yeah. I've been attending the meetings. It's actually, it's a really fascinating group and doing a lot of great work. So I do yeah, definitely. everyone on here to, uh, if you would like to be a part of that, you know, uh, let them know. Yeah, there's, um, the, there's a meeting in an hour, but there's also a um, uh, sort of, um, like a conference, I suppose, uh, tomorrow uh, from 11 to 5 Eastern. So if anyone's interested, uh, there's going to be some great talks on that as well. Yeah, great. Well, thanks a lot, Jonathan. And uh, thank you again, everybody, for uh, joining us. We'll, we'll send out a notification for the next uh, meeting. If there's anybody 
you need me to invite to the meeting, just let me know. Uh, you can either send me an email or Slack me uh, with the, the names and the email address and I'll add them on to all of the lists and stuff. But uh, thank you again for joining. Thanks for our speakers for three very wonderful presentations. Uh, it's awesome to see all the work that's going on out there and uh, let's keep fighting the good fight. We'll beat this thing and uh, it's great to see the scientific community come around that. So uh, have, a, have a great week and uh, uh, keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation and for organizing this in nice, nice okay, meeting. It's very important to, to share this, this information. So thank you, Sean. Thank you, Matei. Thank you, everybody, for organizing this. See you next time. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.